Hello, my name is Dino Hoss and today I'll be running through with you how to construct a bank reconciliation statement. Now before we go through um, explaining how to actually construct a bank reconciliation statement, it's important to understand the reasons why we go about um, putting it together in the first place. As an accountant, of course, we will have already constructed a cash book which tells us, according to the bank columns, exactly how much money we have in our bank account. So if we were to look at this example here, we can see that, according to our bank balance, we should have £6,035 in our bank account. However, the problem arises when the bank sends their own statement which will have been put together by their own accountants. And often, what they think we have in our bank account is different to what our own accountants think is actually on the debit side in terms of the balance board down. So here you can see that our accountants reckon that we have 6,035 in our bank account. But according to the bank statement, their accountant thinks that we only have £5,996 as a balance. So obviously there's a difference between what we think, which is we have 6035 and the bank thinks we have a lesser amount, a smaller amount, of 5996 So the reason why we put together a bank reconciliation statement is to explain the difference as a result of a delay in time. Well, there will be items that the accountant working at the bank doesn't know about, which won't have been entered in the bank statement that they constructed, and there will also be uh, money going in and out of our bank account that our accountant doesn't necessarily know about. And what we're saying is that the difference in the amount of money is only as a result of a delay in time. So in other words, our accountant has to update the cash book, and of course the bank statement will be updated the next time we receive a statement at the end of, in this case, October. So in terms of the bank statement, there will be items that our accountant doesn't know about. Some of those items listed on the bank statement will be the bank transfer, direct bank transfer of course, a possibility of us having an overdraft, a direct debit or a standing order. One of the most common items that's found in the bank statement, which our accountant won't necessarily know about, is a direct debit or a standing order. A direct debit is simply where our customer instructs their bank to make a payment directly from their account electronically into our business account. It could also be the other way around, of course. We could instruct our bank account to pay one of our um, suppliers directly from our bank account into their bank account. It saves us having to write out a cheque. If the amount that is being paid from the bank account is variable, in other words, it changes every month, then it's known as a direct debit. If the amount that's being paid is the same every month, it's known as a standing order. In this case here in the example, we can see that this particular person has a standing order of £146.50, which needs to be paid every month to the TV license company. Another item that is commonly found in our bank statement that our accountant will need to update in the cash book under the bank columns is known as an overdraft. Um, an overdraft is effectively where we use up more money in our bank account than we actually have. In other words, we make more payments for a larger amount than the actual amount of money in our bank account. And of course, if that happens, you would enter a situation where you would go into a negative figure, which is what an overdraft means. Effectively, what you've done is you've borrowed money from the bank, and they've paid, in this case, the $77.27 to whoever you owed money to. And of course, they're not going to do that for free. They're going to charge you an interest, which is usually quite high. But for the odd times where you might be short of money, having an agreed overdraft with the bank helps to make those payments on time. Of course, the overdraft charge wouldn't necessarily be known about in terms of how much it is, in this case $34, and our accountant will have to update that as an expense in the bank column of our cash book. Of course, a very common item these days 
that's found in your bank statement that our chief accountant won't know about until they've actually opened the statement prepared by the bank's accountant is an electronic funds transfer. Uh, in this modern day and age, most money uh, between a customer and the business is transferred electronically. You know, with internet banking, it's very, very easy and simple to simply press a few buttons and send the money from your bank account electronically over the internet into the business's bank account directly. Of course, the old fashioned way was to send the money via a check in the post. Um, some companies still expect to receive checks from their customers and then they go ahead and pay that check into the bank account and take the money uh, from the customer's bank account that way. And of course, many businesses also still make payments to their suppliers uh, by writing out a check and sending the check to them in the post. So here we have a rather useful diagram which explains how electronic payments such as a direct debit or a standing order or an automatic transfer actually works. The sender will instruct their bank to pay the beneficiary, so this could well be the business in this case. The sender's bank will deal with a central bank and that central bank will take the money from the bank account of the sender and will transfer it to the bank account of the beneficiary of the receiver, the business. And it's all done electronically these days through the internet and the computerized systems take the money from the sender's account and they adjust that um, by reducing the amount of money in the sender's bank account and increasing the amount of money in terms of digits in the receiver's bank account. Of course, it's worth mentioning at this point that some customers will write to you bad checks. A bad check is also known in accounting terms as a dishonored check. And that's where a customer has written a check, it's gone through the banking system we discussed, and by the time our bank gets to their bank to take the money out of their account, they find that there is actually no money in there. Again, that would be listed on your bank statement, and our chief accountant would only find out that the check was a bad one once the money had been taken away from the bank account, and that would be shown up on the bank statement. So there we have all the items that would be found in our bank statement, but our accountant wouldn't necessarily know about and would need to be updated in our cash book. In other words, added either on the debit side or the credit side, depending on whether they were payments or money coming into our bank account. Of course, the bank statement will also have items on it that we know about as accountants working and writing up the accounts in our business, but the actual accountant of the bank wouldn't have known about when they worked out how much money we had in our bank account. As most items go through the business bank account, there are actually very few items that the accountants at the bank will not know about when they're drawing up the bank statement for the business. There are really only two items that the bank accountant will not know that our chief accountant will be aware of. And both those items are to do with checks. Now, a check can be written out to pay our creditor, or a check can be sent to us by our customers, in which case it has to be paid into our business bank account. Now, in both cases, the process of sending the check to our customer or receiving and paying it into our bank account will result in a delay in time. And that's the whole point of the bank reconciliation statement to show the difference between the bank statement and our cash book is a result of this delay in time. So, how does a check actually delay the time period in which the actual amount is shown on the debit or credit side of our bank account? Well, when you think about it, if we write a check out and we send it via the post, which usually takes two days, by the time our uh, supplier has received that check, paid it into their bank account, which is probably going to be another day, you're already at three days. Then, of course, a check usually takes another three to four working days to go through the banking system that we discussed earlier on in this video tutorial. So, although we've paid Mr. Bloggs, in this case, two and a half thousand pounds, it won't actually be debited on our bank statement for probably a good seven days. And that's seven working days, so that's actually more than a week. It's the same when we receive a check 
from our customer. We call that a bank lodgement. And again, we have to pay it into our bank account. It will probably have taken a couple of days to arrive in the post. And by the time it goes through the banking system, it could well be five days plus before we actually uh, receive the money into our bank account and it's shown on our bank statement. Right, having been through all the different technical terms, I'm now going to show you how to actually put together a bank reconciliation statement. The first thing to point out, of course, is that there is a difference between what our accountant in this example thinks we have in our bank account, which is 6,035, and what the accountant at the bank thinks we have in our bank account, which is 5,996. Now, when we do our reconciliation statements, as long as the difference is a result of a delay in time because of the checks, then we would be happy that um, we both agree. If the difference isn't identified in the bank reconciliation statement as a result of a delay in time, we know either there's been a theft or there's been an error in terms of how we put together the accounts as accountants, or there's been a mistake at the bank, which does happen sometimes. The first thing to do is to check off the common items between our cash book bank column. So in other words, this is the T account of our bank account and the actual bank statement itself. So you'll find the numbers should match up with a lot of the transactions. So if we looked first of all at uh, cash sales 2100 we can see that our accountant has got that on the debit side and it's also showing as a credit entry in our bank statement now some students ask me well why is it showing as a credit in the bank statement and a debit in our account well the reason for that is that uh, from the bank's perspective when the accountant there is preparing your bank statement you are actually a creditor because they owe you money so uh, whatever is a debit in our book, which is showing money going into our bank account, will be a credit in their bank statement from their perspective. So don't get too confused about that. If you think they should be the opposite way around, then that's correct. Um, if we look also at the 984, we'll find that we can tick that off because we can see the 984 right there as a check payment. Uh, we can tick off the Cozy Brothers 42 because we can see that 42 right there. Uh, we can also see the Suppliers & Co 3090 which is on the September the 10th in the bank statement. We can see the Wheel Garages of 416 which is on September the 15th and we can see the wages that we paid of 1640 is actually shown on the 20th at that date. Now there are some items that in the first instance we don't know about um, as accountants in the company and we can see that those two items are charges that the bank has made so they've charged us $200 and also there is interest as well that we have had to pay in this case probably interest for an overdraft. So those will, be need to, those will need to be updated in our cash book. So what we do is we simply write a C next to them. There are also two items that our bank statement doesn't know about that we have put into our bank T account. And that is two payments, in this case, um, to Brightlight of 772 and OJ of 100. And also we have deposited a check of 627 into our bank account, which is still going through the system and obviously hasn't shown up on the bank statement yet. So that's going to need to be updated in our bank reconciliation statement. So any items that the bank statement doesn't know about, but we do in our cash book, we simply put a B next to them. There are two steps to constructing the bank reconciliation statement. The first step is to update the cash book. So from the previous slide, we can see that we uh, found two items that were not in our cash book. In other words, our accountant didn't know about them, but the accountant at the bank had put them into the bank statement. Those two items were bank charges and bank interest payments. They were on the debit side of our bank statement, so they would go on the opposite side in our bank account, i.e. on the credit side. If we start with a balance of 6035 We have to make these two payments of 284 
what we're left with is a balance carried down of $5,751. That now is the updated cash book bank column amount. So in other words, what we actually have in our bank account is $5,751. And finally, step two is to actually prepare the bank reconciliation statement. So the first thing to do is to take the updated balance as per the cash book. As we just discussed, we have discovered that the true balance in our bank account, according to the debits and the credits, is $5,751. We use that as the first item in our bank reconciliation statement. Of course, the bank reconciliation statement itself will be dated at a particular time. It's usually the same date that is at the top of the bank statement, or in this case, the end of the month, 30th of September. We also have to add in all the items that were unpresented checks. In other words, these were payments to our creditors that the bank statement didn't know about. So we identified from the um, slides that the unpresented checks to Bright Light Company and OJ Company, which were both marked with a B, were for 772 and 100. So we add them to the balance as per the cash book. So 5751 plus 772 plus 100 gives us a balance of 6,623. Any items that we paid in to our bank account. So here we had any company that was one of our customers that paid us by check. That check's still going through the banking system, still hasn't shown up in our bank statement. So we minus the bank lodgements from that balance of 6,623. And we're left with 5,996. Now that, if you remember, is the actual balance that's showing on our bank statement. So now we know that the reason why there was a difference between what we thought we had in our bank account, which was 6,035, and what the actual bank statement is saying we have in our bank account, which was 5,996, is a result of a delay in time. In other words, it's because these unpresented checks to our creditors and the check that was written out by one of our customers, any company, has delayed, if you like, the update of the bank statement. And so the correct amount actually in our account is 5751. And the important reason to remind you that we did the bank reconciliation statement is to prove that there's been no fraud or stealing by our accountants in the company. It's also to show that there's been no errors by the bank themselves. Because if we found that the difference between our cash book balance and the bank statement didn't tally up, in other words, they didn't equal, then we would know that there's either been some sort of thieving going on within our own company or an error made by our accountants, that's also a possibility, or we would check to see that the bank has actually not made any mistakes themselves and um, we would need to go back to them if we felt that they had done. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this tutorial useful. If you did, please hit the like button.